Hello everyone, welcome back to episode 11 of Night Call and we're going to drive some people again. Who are we going to drive? I mean, the game points us towards a V the whole time. Or towards the crazy poet lady, or towards him. We don't know him, let's, let's see what he has to tell us. Hopefully he's more interesting than the other guys. I need to talk to you. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, as long as she pays good, so that's okay too. Talk all you want if you're paying me 30 euros. I'm okay with that. The passenger who gets into the cab greets you in uncertain tones. Good evening. You try to answer as warmly as possible. Good evening. Um, good evening, I want to... She stops short, trembling as if in panic. Is everything all right? And uh, no, it's not. I, I. She begins pouring her heart out. A flood of sorrows fills the cab. I've lost my cab. She shakes her head as if chasing a bad dream. I know, I know. It's it's pretty silly. It's pathetic. But I lost my cat. She holds up a poster of the missing animal. His name is Kruki. <gasps> I knew him. No, he wanted to be driven somewhere and I shoot him away. It's the cat from the other night. You're sure of it? Listen, I know this is going to sound crazy, but someone saw my cat get into, get into a cab. No, I didn't drive him. I feel so bad. So I called your company and asked which taxis were in the neighborhood the night he, he disappeared. You were the only one. I need your help. Her tone is increasingly hesitant and secure. Please tell me, you know where he is. Where's Kruki? Where's my cat? She takes a deep breath. It's a question of life and death. I saw him, but I didn't transport him. I'm so sorry. She sits up straight with a jerk. That's, that's wonderful. Where is he? Take me there. He took the train. <laughs> what? No, I didn't transport him anywhere. I, no, I don't want to lie to her either. He took the train? How am I... How can I tell her that? I shoot him away. I don't want to lie. He took the train. It doesn't make any sense. The train? She looks down at the poster in her hand. That's why he stole my money. I knew he was up to something. What the hell? Your cat stole your money? He's so smart for a little ball of love. Did you talk to him? You remain quiet. I'm sure you talked to him. Crook, he's not just any old cat, you know. He saved my life. I adopted him when he was still a tiny kitten. I took care of him, spoiled him, fed him for weeks. I took time off work to take care of the little thing. I knew right away he wasn't like other cats, he was different. I stood up for him too. When my friend said he was taking up too much room in my life, I dropped them. When they told me he couldn't come with me to work anymore, I changed companies. He's the only reason I get out of bed in the morning. Please, I'm begging you. When my mother died, I decided to get a cat. I thought it would take my mind off of things, get me interested in something else, and then... She stares at you. I'm going to ask you one last time. Do you know where my cat is? I'm gonna tell the truth. Your cat got into my cab. Her eyes flash with hope. I shoot him away. I don't run errands for cats. I'm a cab driver. Her tone is icy. He's more than a cat. He's my friend. How should I have known that? She lowers her eyes. He's lost now. Her hand reaches for the door handle. Stop the cab. You pull up to the sidewalk. I can't take it anymore. Change seems to have come over her as if she's no longer the same person. She curls her lips into a sneer and lets out a nasty laugh. Nobody can understand that he's not a cat. Police woman laughed in my face. My friends think I'm crazy. And you? You... She shakes her head. Her voice is cracked. 
He's probably dead by now. He spent his entire life with me. He doesn't know how to survive on his own. He sure as hell knew how to take money from you, so I guess he knew something about life. I wouldn't count on it that he's dead. She stares daggers at you, then unleashes a torrent of anger. He needed your help and you abandoned him. Well, and he abandoned you. She gets out of the cab and walks away without shutting the door. The next minute she's gone, swallowed up by the night. Hey, you get out and close the door. You take a deep breath, your lungs freeze. You wait another minute, then get back inside and start the engine. Oh, I hope you paid something. <laughs> hey, she did pay, thanks. What the hell? <laughs> I'm sorry I didn't transport the cat. It was a misunderstanding. I didn't know what would happen if I gave that answer. I wanted to transport him. Ah, uh, let's just let's just do it. Let's just see what she has to tell us. I mean, seriously, she's giving us hell about it that she lost her that her cat left and that I didn't the words, I can sense them, they're calling me. Oh, well, okay. Oh, let's, let's drive you. This isn't that a billabong or something? Your next passenger immediately raises her hand. Drive. I don't care where, I just need you to drive. Again. <laughs> That's not how this works. <laughs> Your passenger just pinches her face. Oh no, I can feel the words getting away, getting away from me. Ah. She opens the door and runs off down the street. <laughs> what? <laughs> By the time you turn around, she's vanished. You sit there for a moment, something hits your windshield. You get out of the car, lean toward the wipers and discover a small white seashell. You look around, no one. You hurry back to the driver's seat and drive away. What the hell? <laughs> that was my whole evening. Now I gotta go home. I shouldn't have driven her, I knew it. Crazy lady. I think Salim is our is the is one of our days. If one of our um um suspects things. Oh my god, we're so low on money. I broke Francine's heart. What the hell? I already met Alicia. But hey, it did save that I met the, the future lady, so I don't know what the hell is happening. Okay, well, we lost a lot of money. We don't have a lot of money left, but I think it's... It you open your front door and your foot hits something. Ooh, more evidence. An envelope. Someone slid it under the door, pussy. Do you open it straight away? It's a police file you laid on the table. It must be from your passenger, the whistleblower. He smiled, he kept his word. Ooh, more. You take a few minutes to update your board with your new clues. A bus goes by, making the walls shake. You take your shoes off before getting to work. Oh, boy. What? Homeless man seen around crime scene two and three? Heard it at a gas station? I don't like that. Hervé, what the hell? Yes, it was. It is Salim. So after we talked to him today, I, could, I can't imagine him being the judge. He, do, he didn't seem like it. He stands for justice through the justice system. So, I don't think that he did it. I think a lot points to him at the moment, but I don't think he did it. Wait a second, we didn't even get anything to read, so what did we... <sighs> so what are our new infos? It's just that... Homeless man, but I heard that at a gas station. I don't know, I still think it's the police guy. It's him. But at the moment, the game kind of 
shoves us into different directions like he could be but I don't think he is he he wasn't strange <laughs> I guess that doesn't matter but he's fighting for like a justice system and he's working in it and I don't know what to do what whoa, whoa, whoa wait a second was a promising football player when he was 10 victim one was a great football coach and the victim what was he the molested kid oh, damn it it doesn't say when i don't remember when it was when when this event should have taken place damn i wish i had money but he was young he is young and what about wrinkled hands Okay, no, I'm just gonna end the night and... I mean, shouldn't his phone ring? You impulsively take a step back. Ooh, it's the moment of truth. What? Already? Pick up. Oh no. Hello? Hi. Ice cold. So? She heaves a long sigh. There's no background noise. She must not be at the station. Where are you? I'm... For a second you think she's going to tell you, but then... Somewhere. None of your business. A light clinking noise. The sound of a teacup on a coaster, maybe? I'm listening. What have you got for me? She clears her throat. Her voice sounds louder and more confident. You glance at the wall. The suspects are all lined up. All the evidence. A whole mess of your ideas. Your stomach is in a knot. I don't have to remind you, you cannot get this wrong. I have a meeting in two hours with the district attorney and the chief of police. Oh my god, that's it already. I thought we had one more night. Even the minister of the interior will be in a corner of the room somewhere. Obviously, I'm thrilled. Oh, oh, but I certainly don't want to put too much pressure on you. You can almost hear the smirk she must be wearing. You lay the receiver down on the table. Now you have to decide. What? Oh my, no. Come on, really? That's it? I think it's him. I think it's him. I do. And I hope I'm not wrong. I, I have to, I know, I'm just doing it. Yes, I'm accusing him. You pick the phone back up and explain your choice to Lieutenant Pussy. Why, how, the evidence, your sources. She listens without saying a word. You stop talking and catch your breath. Okay. I'll buy it. Seems like a solid choice. I can fish around a bit to vet your information. She pauses. You can almost hear her nodding. I'll call you tonight. Try to get some sleep. She pauses. No way she's going to hang up on such a positive note. No, she's probably going to. It might be your last night of freedom. Thanks. She snickers and hangs up. You put the phone down, you might as well be standing in the ice-cold emptiness of outer space. You decide to go to bed, to sleep, best way to kill time. So, the interesting thing is, I mean, how is a taxi driver more suited to solve a case like this? I hope we're not going to die. I don't know, I... You had a hard night, restless. You get the impression you aged five years in a matter of hours. You get up quickly. And a few minutes later, you're outside of your studio. Oh yeah, we're going to work now. Oh, great. <sighs> You've barely gotten downstairs when you catch sight of Pussy. Oh no. Will she arrest us? She's leaning up against the do door of your cap, eyes wide open, forehead creased. Get in. You obey, it's too early to react. She settles into the backseat, flashes a smile. Good news, you're right. Or at least the DA thinks your evidence is sufficient. No emotion in her voice. She's giving you the facts, nothing more. I'm going to bring Fargo Na in tonight. She nods, her expression clouds over. I have trouble. She freezes. Fargo Na is... Fragonar is a mentor. Mine and half the squads. You can't understand. He's an institution. He's... She stops, clears her throat. I need your help. One last time. 
Later on tonight, we're going to get Fragonard to leave home and find a way to get him into your taxi. What? She pulls some kind of pen out of her pocket that she puts in the little cubby just above the car stereo. This is a bug. I held up my end of the deal. Come on, you can't just sit me, set me in the same car with my murderer again. Our deal is just between you and me. I can always break it, you know? Go back to the DA, get you thrown in jail. She shakes her head. What a bitch. Listen. She takes a dramatic pause and doesn't really know where she's going. I've seen you and heard you enough to know that you have a trick, a gift for getting people to talk. I need someone I can trust to get close to Fragonard without making him suspicious. He's a cop. He knows how we work. No one's ever sent a taxi driver to make an arrest. He won't put up a fight. I hope he'll open up to you, that he'll confess before things fall apart. Not too far from the hospital where he goes for his treatments. There's an alleyway under construction. There won't be any civilians, just us and him. She sighs. Two teens walk by the cab and the intense smell of wheat fills the cab. Busset doesn't budge. I know you can do it. If you stick to the plan, nothing can go wrong. What if there's a problem? If you stick to the plan, there won't be any problems. She lays her hands on the door handle. You pick the suspect up, drive to the meeting point, and you're free. Easy as pie. She gets out of the cab, slams the door, and walks quickly away. Shit, shit, shit. You hit the dashboard. Intense pain spreads through your hand. You grab the keys in the ignition and turn. The motor comes on. Your night is about to begin. Your last night. What the hell? I mean, what are we? A Superman taxi driver? Let's just drive the, let's just drive the crazy guy again. He's going home again. So what did hit you this time? Another electric car? The passenger getting in your taxi is a famous polemicist, Francois de la Nerie, who you've driven home before. He doesn't seem to recognize you. Actually, he barely looks at you. You start driving. Are you bothered by all of these protest marches? This question washes over you. You forgot that during the day people were holding protests. I work nights. Ah. He doesn't know how to follow up. A moment goes by before he yelps. Ah, see? There's not much chance they'd come to protest at 3 a.m., huh? It's not really surprising, actually. They want to make change, but only when it's convenient. Well, they also want to make change when people can see it. At 3 a.m., no one will be awake to watch. Not during vacations, not on weekends, not at nights. They make fun of us in other countries. France, the land of strikes, the land of protest marches. This country is filled with jackasses, slackers and simpletons. Uh, what? But they protest nonetheless. What do you mean by that? I mean, they take the bus or the train specifically to protest. Well, yes, they certainly do like to protest. But actually, most of the people on strike just stay at home and don't work. Before you can get the slightest word in edgewise, he starts in again. Take the United States, for example. They have no right to strike. It's do or die. Spit flies from his mouth and disappears somewhere on the back seat. Ew. And they didn't become the most powerful country in the world by going on strike all the time. He snickers. His notebook appears in his hand and he begins to write. Strike, protest, unrest. While businessmen and manufacturers are working around the clock. French people should be ashamed. Take a look in the mirror and decide to change to do something. They expect too much from life. They want to have their cake and eat it too and bite off more than they can chew. Wow, he's even writing a poem now. He catches his breath. Froth begins to form at the corners of his mouth. Oh. Wow. And meanwhile, the world keeps turning. While the strikers twiddle their thumbs, workers are working. No, struggling to get the job done, that's better. Idiotic protest marches. 
the fringest thing and the stupidest. We have to look the masses in the eye and say, you do not own the streets. You shall not wield them like weapons. He suddenly raises his eyes and looks at you. They are confused and his complexion deathly pale. Are you okay? Is he getting a stroke now? Your passenger's gaze wanders somewhere beyond the windshield. I, I just remember that. I once marched. It just came back to me like an old childhood memory. I can see it clearly. From Versailles to Paris. To Paris. I can picture the banners, the songs, and the people's faces. There were so many of us. We got up at dawn, thousands of us, and were marched toward the capital. Our pure and wholesome voices rose up. His voice shakes a bit. What were you marching for? It was a cry from the heart of the right for high quality religious education while France was being crushed by the weight of socialism. We were being ideologically purged, completely decimated. It was the end of parochial schools. The end of our culture as we knew it. His voice trembles. Did you win? <laughs> yes, we won. So protesting is okay then? <laughs> yeah, I do wanna. His forehead pitches forward as if his head were too heavy. We weren't being heard. We weren't being respected. Perhaps you are right. A single finger interrupts the conversation. But we didn't go on strike. We didn't bother anyone with our banners or our gatherings. And yet we still won. He sighs contentedly as he pulled a taxi up along the sidewalk. Those were the days. It was a great time. The left was running the country. He leans in towards you like he's about to tell you a secret with a smirk on his face. And I mean the real left, huh? He pays and gets out of the car. You can hear him talking to himself as he walks towards the front door of his building. What a lovely night. Good luck to you tomorrow. With all these protest marches, it's going to be a messy one. He's gone before you have the time to remind him you only work nights. <laughs> you notice a newspaper on a backseat. Your last passenger must have left it behind, or the one before. You grab it and put it away. Could come in handy. You start driving. Well, thanks for not tipping. Okay, well, there's just him to pick up. Oh, that's that's our guy, right? Um, okay, well then, let's go pick him up. Please don't kill me. Mm-hmm, that's him. Your next passenger is your suspect, the retired policeman. Judging by his looks, you could have easily guessed. Hospital Saint Louis, please. You nod your head and start the engine. The passenger seems to have his mind elsewhere, not entirely awake, stubble on his chin. Scan his skin, his movements, his attitude, his... It's cold as shit this morning. His voice makes you jump. You nod. If more people are not as many when it's cold out like this. Folks tend to stay home when it's too cold. Might be more of them. They make shorter trips. Makes sense. Dead silence. Talk about the weather. It's worse in summertime though. People don't take cabs as much. When they do, they go further. Obviously. You drive in silence for a second. The road goes by. You don't want to look in your side mirrors too often. You haven't seen a trace of the cops yet. Busset told you not to worry, but... No, it's funny. Just this morning, I was thinking about an old case. One of my first cases, actually. It was just after the Mesrine case. You know who Mesrine is, don't you? Or am I really that old? You sent it's the right time to get him to talk. That rings a bell. Jacques Mesrine, breaking and entering, kidnapping, armed robbery. He killed two cops in Canada, tortured a journalist, far right one, but still. 
Then in 1979, after being on the run for a year and a half, the cops catch him and kill him, Porte Klingancourt. He raises a hand. Now the cops say it was in self-defense, but I know for a fact they shot him down like a dog. He looks straight at you. You can see the hint of an underground fire roaring deep in his eyes. Now I most certainly do not want to die like a dog, understood? He catches his breath and is clearly shaken. He ever so slowly reaches into his pocket and pulls out his weapon. What? Where did Boucher ask you to take me? Oh my god! No! I don't know what you're talking about. Don't take me for a fool. I swear I have no idea what you're talking about. A gun appears. Shame. Thought I might just get a chance at some honesty in this cold world. Just once. Just to see what it feels like. I dedicated my whole life to the justice system, to getting to the truth. At least that's what I tell myself and what I say to new recruits. But I'm tired of all the games, all the fucking lies. Where they order to take you? Where did they order you to take me? Oh god, shall we tell the truth now? Uh, he hates he hates lies, so I guess I can tell. It. Uh, tell the truth. I don't know. Yeah. A warehouse, some old garage. They're waiting for us there. An ambush. I'm no misleading, you know. I'm gonna pull a grenade out from under the back seat here. He cuts off with a groan. When he starts speaking again, his voice is chilling. Busy. You can see his finger on the trigger. It's shaking ever so slightly. How much does she know? I don't know. The stench of gunpowder fills the cab. Your vision is blurred for a while. You can't feel your legs anymore and the shock of heat is streaming down your spine. The taxi slows and ends up running into a car parked along the side of the road. The impact sets its alarm off. It lights, its lights shower the street with red and yellow. I I'm sorry. Sorry it turned out like this. You deserve better, you know. You're so focused on helping others that you forget to take care of yourself. You want to speak, but no sounds comes out. I read your file, you know. What you did for your sister-in-law, taking seven years in jail for her. He nods his head. You deserve better. Your neck muscles give out and your head collapses. Bits of the outside world make it in, maybe not in the right order. The door closing. The back seat empty. A shape coming over the cab, screaming, shouting. And just like that, darkness. Okay, oh, I'm confused. Did we do something wrong? I mean, should I have told him the truth straight away? Should I have kept lying? Should I... I guess it's safe to say that I just died. I just want to know where we can start again. Okay, so we can start the last day. Okay. Okay, so I'm just gonna skip this real fast. I just wanna try it out one more time. Okay, well, it's had to redo the whole day. Now it's time to pick this guy up again. So I was thinking about it, maybe we just shouldn't start any um, conversation, but I think that he will at some point, he will find out. The problem is I just tried to look on the internet and I could find nothing about it. So I'm not sure, are we even supposed to get out of there alive? But I suppose so, or I hope so, or I don't know. I don't know what to do. I mean, I was also thinking, considering that I should just continue lying maybe okay i'm just gonna say nothing now i'll just give this i'll give this one more try and i'll stay to maybe lying or something if he ta if he starts i don't know if he starts finding out about me then i'll just continue lying and then we'll see if i die or whatever 
but I'm pretty sure that we're not supposed to die. That just can't be like the end. There is so much that we don't know about ourselves, and I could imagine that all the other chapters that we're going to do, that there are all the other scenarios that there are, that we will still be us. So I'm just gonna go with say nothing. You drive in silence for a second, the road goes by. You don't want to look in your side mirrors too often. You haven't seen a trace of the cops yet. Busey told you not to worry, but... You know, it's funny. Just this morning, I was thinking about an old case. One of my first cases, actually. It was just after the Miss Green case. You know who Miss Green is, don't you? Or am I really that old? You sense it's the right time to get him to talk. So that rings a bell. Didn't work for us. Shall we just say no that we never heard of him? Maybe he keeps talking then. I don't know. Never heard of him. Let's just say that. Jacques Misrin breaking and entering kidnapping armed robbery. He killed two cops in Canada. Blah, blah. We all we all know that. Ah <sighs> It always points to this. Shall we just not <laughs> Damn it. Busey. Don't take me for a fool. Keep lying. I swear I have no idea what you're talking about. A gun appears. Shame. Thought I might just get a chance. Uh, we already know that. Oh, I don't want to die again. Seriously? Okay, I'm lying. He shakes his head, saddened by your answer. I can't quite figure out if you were avoiding me, but I know Busey put you on the case and gave you a copy of the file. We don't know each other too well, huh? so I'm going to give you one last chance to tell me the truth. Busey. You can see his finger on the trigger, shaking ever so slightly. How much does she know? If I just say don't shoot, we'll see- Oh, okay, you don't want to be shot. Well then, I guess I won't shoot you. Guess that's not gonna happen. So I don't know you didn't get us. She has evidence. Does she though? Maybe. I don't want to do this all again, but I don't want to... Mm, okay. She has evidence. You hear a long sigh coming from the back seat. A few seconds go by. You try to concentrate on driving despite your sweaty hands and dripping brow. Okay. Why hasn't she tried to arrest me then? You shrug. Don't know. She told me it would be easier this way. I think she hopes you turn yourself in without a fight. He looks away. You know, Busse is really one of a kind, but she doesn't fit into today's world. Neither do I, for that matter. The weapon he's holding is shaking slightly, wavering. You suddenly notice he's speaking to you in a more familiar tone. <gasps> That's why I killed them. Bastards, all of them. Rapists, murderers and liars who escaped prosecution. Now Busse, Busse would like to do the same thing I did. Slam a bullet into the head of the first murderer she could get her hands on. But she can't. Just can't do that anymore. Well, you shouldn't. A long, painful, heavy sigh. Any case, now there's only one truth left. No more confrontation, no debate. No need for justice to be served. They were guilty and I killed them. I can write that down if you want, it's no secret. I knew I'd be caught sooner or later, either by Busey or by... Sentence hangs in the air. I'm sick. Got cancer all over. I hope some new drug might cure me, but what's the point, honestly? He abruptly accelerates his speaking pace. I don't want to go to jail. A cop can go to jail. I don't want to see my face on the cover of magazines and newspapers. But I don't want to deny Busey the pleasure of catching me. Her and her team. So here's what we're going to do. What? I did it? There's a place in Montmartre. A place I really love. It's my first memory of Paris. I must have been six or seven. My mother had come all the way from Martinique. She thought she could convince my father to... Yeah, anyway, there is no point in telling that story. I want to hear it. Don't kill me. He snickers. By yourself some time? No, no. There's a bench up there, not far from Sacre Coeur. This bench has two clear advantages. First, it faces the city of Paris, southern facing. All the monuments are there, staring back in splendor. 
He starts to speak with confidence. I especially like it when all the buildings poke out above the cloud of pollution. Notre Dame's square towers, Pompidou and its colored pipes, the Eiffel Tower. He shakes his head and his voice sounds deep and serious again. Second advantage to sitting on his bench is that you turn your back to Sacre Coeur, an ugly building. You only build it to rub the church the right way. He looks away and remains silent for a while. His hands shake a little. I want to see Paris one last time. It's a little too early to watch the sunrise, but at least there'll be people around. Lovers, life. Just want to go and sit on the bench, look out at Paris, alone, for five minutes. And then you can go to the meeting point so Bussy can pick me up. What do you say? Ah, oh, this sounds so dangerous and so stupid. But I guess, I mean, <laughs> only five minutes, you promise? You know, I suppose that if we drive him there, he will shoot himself. I mean, I can't deny him anyway, so let's go. He will shoot himself, I'm pretty sure about it. Turn around. You'll see, the view is incredible. Neither of you says a word for several minutes, you drive in silence. Then as you're beginning to climb up to the top of Montmartre, the, top, the cop lowers his weapon. I want to apologize. I'm sorry I hurt you the night of the attack. Everything I could have turned out so differently. You're nothing like the guy I took down, you know. He was a kid at the time, but there was something in his eye. Something bad, something evil. His eyes sparkle for a bit. Tears, perhaps? Seconds later, you park a few meters away from Sacre Coeur. Bench is right over there. Just need five minutes. Five minutes and we'll go. Got it? You nod. I kind of want to say don't do it. Because that's just like the easy way out to take. Let's just do it. Let's just say it. He lays his hand on the door handle and gives you a genuine smile. Do what? You're going to kill yourself, aren't you? He pauses. To be perfectly honest, I don't really know yet. The cop suddenly seems older than he really is. His voice croaks slightly as he says to you. Thanks, friend. We're not friends! You killed me, almost! He gets out of the cab. You watch the old cop. He takes a few steps towards the bench, walks around it like he wants to look at it from every angle. He doesn't so much as glance at Sacre Coeur and its dome lit up with powerful spotlights. A few passers-by chill to the bone or wandering about nonchalantly in a square in front. The cop finally sits on the bench. He stays there a long minute, contemplating Paris. Strings of light weave around traffic circles and intersections, making a magnificent canvas. There's a sudden movement. In a matter of seconds, he pulls the gun out of his pockets and up to his chin. Yeah, I thought so. And shot, a shot rings out. Thanks, friend. Those were his last words. Are you fucking kidding me? No. Lieutenant Bussy watches, uh, watches you. Her jaw is clenched, locked more like. What else did he say? He confessed to his crimes. The wire you put in a cab must have got it all. You have the recording. Bussy stares at you for a second before looking away. Shit, shit. Shit, this is not how it's supposed to end. You're not clear on whether she's angry or sad. What happens now? The cop heaves a long sigh. <sighs> Fine, you can leave. You're free. I mean, stay in the area, okay? We'll have questions for you. Did... She hesitates for a second. Her lip is shaking. She's emotional. He talked about you. About me? What did he say? It's all in the recording. You said you were like him. Now that's not a compliment. Of course, that guy was my mentor, a father figure actually. He taught me everything I know. That's why I slipped you his file. I couldn't investigate him. No one on the team wanted to either. It was unthinkable, unfeasible. <sighs> Fuck. A semblance of a smile spread across her face. Awkward, strained perhaps. It makes your blood curdle. Here. You're free to go now. Don't leave the country, though. We might have some questions for you at some point. Really? What questions do you have for me? She opens the door. Icy air seeps in. You shiver. You really came through, you know. Didn't think you'd do so well. Her voice breaks up a bit with her last words. Who knew? 
She gets out of the cab and slams the door behind her. A blunt metallic noise, unidentifiable vibrations. The car quakes and shakes like a boat. A minute goes by before you can move again. You slowly come back to your senses. <sighs> yeah, I want to drive away. Key in the ignition, handbrake off, full in the accelerator. You leave Sector Kerr behind. Ooh, okay. Now we did it. We did it. That was interesting. So now we had, we like finished one chapter of, of the game. We met a few of our patrons, I guess, of our guests. I guess there's more to discover about them. We haven't, certainly haven't met all of them. So yeah, that was it. That was the first chapter, I guess. So I wonder how they would, how they will incorporate it in like the next chapters that we work again. Will we say just come walk up again and say, hey, want to help us again? And if not, you're the murderer. I, well, <laughs> maybe who knows? But it is certainly an interesting game. I mean, it has its flaws. It's it, it's got its flaws, I'd say, like the whole um, uh, investigation, like your investigation board. It's it is pretty. Um... <laughs> oh, Kruki is a really a team pet. So, um, what I wanted to say was, yeah, the investigation board is kind of a mess. Like, it is kind of hard to spot what new um, evidence you uh, collected throughout the days as soon as it starts to get crowded. Um, so, yeah. But it's certainly interesting and I think I'm gonna give the second chapter a try just because I want to know um, how it will be incorporated and we will investigate on something else. So the sun is about to come up. You drove all night long with your window open and the radio tuned to that phantom frequency. The electric static kept you awake. You're so tired your chest is tight and your eyes are heavy but you can't stop. Not now. You're going to run out of gas soon. The light went on about 20 kilometers back. You're somewhere in Normandy. You pull over onto the shoulder and get out. There's almost no traffic. You step over the guardrail as your eyes adjust to the colorful break of dawn. The sun will soon rise over the horizon. You get your phone out and dial a number. It doesn't ring, direct to voicemail. A voice asks you to leave a message after the beep. Hey, I, I wanted to... to catch your breath. When Ade told me she'd held onto your phone just to hear the sound of your voice, I thought it was stupid. But now, the sun is slowly rising and its colors are flooding the landscape. Bare underbrush, a tiny village lost in fog off in the distance, a hilltop sparkling with dew. The view seems alien to you. I wanted to thank you for giving me the opportunity to redeem myself. Thanks. That word disgusts you, but it's too late. Thanks to you, I did something important. I mean, I think. Who knows? Silence. Your head is spinning. You haven't spoken to your brother in years. Well, in a manner of speaking. You grin. Your kids are good. I don't know his kids. What? Ah, Ade is good. Ade is good. We know that. She's doing better. Her business is doing well. Who is Ade? She doesn't think about you so much anymore. She's seeing someone right now. I think she doesn't tell me everything. Pause. A truck flies by just meters from you. I thought when it was all over, I mean, I thought I'd be able to get some decent sleep. Close my eyes and sleep. Really sleep, finally. But sleeping is just a break. It doesn't put an end to it. It all starts up again as soon as... A voice cuts you off. You have reached the maximum time limit. Please... You hang up. Your phone feels heavy in your hand. What should you do now? There's a broken fence in front of you leading to a small footpath into the woods. Behind you is the highway leading to the sea. What? Disappear? I don't want to disappear. Call Christoph the priest. Let's call the priest, why not? You dial the number of the priest you talk to. It's ringing. He picks up. From the sound of his voice, you can tell you haven't woken him up. Hello, yes. 
You take a deep breath. Something in your throat is tight, making it hard to breathe. Hello? Answer. It's me, Hussein, the taxi driver. So we met ourselves. That is, our name is Hussein. He pauses. Not for long. He recognizes you right away. Oh, I'm happy to hear from you. All the feelings you've been burying inside are ready to come out. Your knees are shaking. I need to talk to you. It's urgent. Okay, so that was it. Now we got the full ending of it, I guess. So now we can take a look at the Pasadex and as we see, as we haven't met a lot of people. So there is still a lot of people to meet. So yeah, anyway, that was the first chapter and it's a very small game. So like when you look on, on it, when you look for it on the internet, you also don't see anything about it. Just like the announcements, press announcement and anything. So there's not really much help to get either. So I'm pretty happy that we figured it out that um, how to survive on the second try because it was kind of annoying. I really had to redo the whole day. But anyway, um, if you made it so far in the series and in the Let's Play, thank you for sticking with me and for experiencing the game with me together. I'm gonna give the next chapter a try for sure. And of course, there will going to be, there's going to be videos about it too. So thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.